Thank you, Jessica. Ready when this time, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I'd like to call the Isabella County Board of Commissioners Finance and Administration Committee meeting to order. <coughs> um, 10 o'clock on Tuesday, February 8th, 2022. First off, we'll go to the public. Call the public. I want to turn, spin my chair and <coughs> I want to speak this lovely day. I will now go to the phones. Anybody on the phone or the virtual? is not at this time, Mr. Chairman. Very good. In the interest of time, I will now close public comment. Next up, consider approving the agreement regarding the easement. Uh, Sheriff, it's not, was the Sheriff going to make the presentation? Oh, oh that's me. Okay. That's me. And I, I did let him know this would be on the agenda, but this is far more administrative than he cares about. Although it's going to be hard for him to get the proper infrastructure to the new facility if these things aren't approved. But uh, two different motions here, so one, one uh, staff report. The first one is an agreement regarding easement. Now, of course, the owners of the property before the county bought it, this is where the new sheriff's office and correctional facility property, this is where that, that project will be cited. The owners we purchased it from, of course, had an easement with consumers power for the, the utility lines that cross over the property. But what we're planning for the utilities that will service the project, it kind of gave an opportunity for us to tighten down that easement. Really, the agreement regarding easement serves to reduce the existing easement down to 20 feet on each side of the high voltage line and guy wires and 15 feet on each side of the low voltage line um, as they cross that property. So basically through that agreement, consumers energy is granted unimpaired um, access to its facilities in that easement strip and the county is held to such conditions we can't plant trees in that you know we can't plant vegetation that might reach the their lines um, we can't alter the ground elevation in the easement strip so that is the first agreement the second agreement is called the conditional consent of easement holder and this is from consumers energy to us and it allows for our planned driveway, our sewer lines, and our water lines to go under that easement. So basically the, that agreement says that those improvements are permitted facilities and so they won't be considered in conflict with the easement. So basically simply that's what those two, those two agreements do in the, in the conditional consent of easement holder where they're allowing our, um, our improvements to go under the easement were held to conditions again not planting trees we can't even we can't build fences on it retaining walls we can't even put a dumpster in the area so but those are the kind of things that were held to in, in that agreement we have to call miss dig if we're, if we're doing anything in in that area so as i said before um, you can choose to not approve these but it's going to be pretty hard to service that new project area without a water line a sewer line and a driveway so no costs associated with these agreements, um, just the filing fee if the Register of Deeds so chooses to charge that to us. Any questions about these agreements? Mr. Jelzinski, at one time, did not you talk about doing something with doing something about well, power lines going over or dump with underground or something? I know before when I was first hired for the County Parks and Recreation, we had a voltage line that went diagonal across coal water cut through the campground and everything. And um, I, I contacted uh, consumers at that time to see if there's something they could do to reroute that. And what they did is they just took that section out and they connected the homes uh, on either side of the park to the grid elsewhere. And so it just eliminated that whole headache. And you said there's high power and low power. So I'm thinking, I don't know where the high power comes across the expressway or, or why it runs in that direction. But I was just thinking at some point in the future, if, if we decided we need that property for something, they may be able to reroute it, even if we have to give them a new easement right along the boundary. Just a thought in the future. 
Yeah, I don't <coughs> hoping you have anything to. I, I, I don't. I, I assume those lines are high enough that it won't just put the trucks getting in. Exactly. Yes. I guess my, my alerted own, us to that. I'm sure. My, my only <laughs> statement would be is there something in the future that we can do? Why do they have to be above ground? Why most are most power lines buried now? And why is it there that they're above maybe just because? I mean, I mean, I know it was a farmer's field and it really didn't pertain to anything, but now that you were developing that, why can't those be put into the ground? So you couldn't, you don't have the accidental hit or, you know, doing whatever. I mean, I would think that, again, I just, I, I don't know if that inquiry has ever been made. I mean, I have not, and I certainly can inquire. I mean, you know, obviously, you would think, our, yeah, you would think Clark or Clark or Integrated could answer that in a second, yeah. probably. I mean, that's kind of what their role is. Yes, yes. I'm I just, can, I can I'm this little podunk Jim Horton sitting here, you know, just kind of sitting there going, "What if?" You know, something like that. Sort of. But yeah, I mean, it, obviously, you need an easement going across to build what a driveway going across, put yes. sewer lines, do anything. Um, so now that's not going to affect again the height. Of the, are we going to have that? Probably won't be any issue with cranes or anything going through there. Probably can lower the crane and get it up. In that, but I'm assuming so. Okay, that's fine. I believe so. All right, we got two. Uh, Nicole, uh, Nicole hit both three and four. So, Jerry, you want to do three and I'll do four? Okay. Uh, I will move that we. Uh, move the agreement regarding easement between Isabella County and Consumers Energy, Isabella County Sheriff's Office to Correctional Facility to the work session and authorize the board chairperson to sign the same to the work session. I will support that. Any further discussion? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed the same? Okay, that'll go forward. Next up will be consider approve, approving the conditional consent of easement motion or motion of approving the conditional consent of easement holder offered to Isabella County by Consumers Energy Company for the Isabella County Sheriff's Office and Correctional Facility Project and authorize the board chairperson to sign the same. Support. We have a motion or consideration to in support. Any further discussion? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed the same. That will move forward then to the work session, then on to the board. Next up. The fiscal year 2023 budget calendar. Um, numero uno. Hello again. So yes, uh, a little bit early, but we're excited uh, to present this budget calendar to you. It does ramp things up, um, starts things earlier. And as we walk through here, you'll see um, offers more drafts to come to finance. And we'll just walk through uh, today, February 8th, coming to Finance Committee and next Tuesday for full board consideration. Early April, we are going to hold um, our budget workshop where all the elected officials and department heads come with uh, their staff that helps them prepare the budget, if, if they have any that do that. And we walk through what the year is going to look like. We walk through what uh, administration will prepare in the budget. And in administration, we generally take care of all the wages and, and benefits um, type of retirements, health costs, PTO payouts, that type of thing. Um, if we do seek input from the departments at their, their um, the meetings that we have with them and uh, we incorporate their feedback in that. If there's any retirements, you know, we talk about that kind of thing that might affect those wages and benefit lines. But other than those lines, the departments basically get a budget worksheet with you know, things to, to fill in and they actually go into the BSNA software and fill that out themselves, which is a fantastic um, improvement from how it used to be where we were entering everything. So we hand out that stuff at the at that budget workshop and about a month later, early May, we're gonna ask departments to have that due back um, to administration. That's about a month, 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 five, six weeks earlier than they're, they're used to having that back in. Then we hold, um, we have a couple of weeks where we hold those budget meetings with departments. Um, that'll be myself and Chris Whitmer and Melissa Frankquist, both accountants from administration. And we'll sit down with each department um, really valuable time for us all, I think. We take all of that feedback and accounting prepares, 
the what we call the department requested budget, right? It's always that big scary one. That first draft is going to come to finance in mid June, and that's where we tell you how many millions of dollars were over in the in the requests, right? Compared to what the, the revenues look like. That's always a scary one, but anticipated. And then we start we start working away at the budget. Um, I meet again with any elected officials or department heads that we need to revisit and talk about my recommendations for what needs to change in regards to those department budgets. End of June, we'll look to finalize those and basically prepare what's called the recommended budget. That's my recommended budget to this committee. So second draft will come in early July. We'll talk about what's incorporated in that. We'll talk about some options of what needs to happen and you will direct me um, in that regard as to what options you would like to choose and then I'll prepare another draft and another draft if needed. So we'll have, once that recommended budget comes to you in mid-July, we'll have a full month before that recommended budget goes out in board packets to the rest of the board. They'll always have, of course, the opportunity to come here and, and hear what we're talking about. Um, once that recommended budget goes to the board in early August, um, we would like to have the board set the public hearing date, which of course is a requirement to set that, but we'd like to, to set it a little earlier this year. We always adopt the budget in what's considered our annual meeting, that second meeting in September. And we always seem to have the public hearing at that same meeting. So if the public were to offer um, some comments on the budget that you would like to consider, there's really not a lot of time to do that before its adoption. So this budget calendar has that, that public hearing being held at the first meeting in September. It has my budget presentation at the second meeting in August. So uh, you can see, the public can see what's recommended, the details of the budget. A couple of weeks later will be that public hearing. And then a couple of weeks after that, adoption of the budget by the commissioners, um, taking into consideration all of that feedback opportunities. That's my thoughts on a budget calendar for fiscal 23. I like it. I like the additional time because I, it was before we get surprises, two weeks before we had to adopt the budget. And that never set well with me. Even if I supported it, it would never set well. Well, so this, I think this is a big improvement. I agree 100%. I, I like more drafts coming to finance. I like moving the calendar up so we have more time. I like having the public hearing prior to adoption. All good ideas. Yeah, yeah I really like good the process. I really like the August 16th when it's presented to the work session. I think then, I echo on Commissioner Jalazinski's statement, I think then the commissioners can have a good dialogue on it. Instead of getting the dialogue on the first meeting in September, yeah. and then we got to make the decision the next meeting, it got kind of tight. And then, you know, you always like to, you know, the first things out of my mouth sometimes, well, we, how are we going to afford that? And then without, then you say that, and you're like, well, let me, we got four weeks now to discuss that instead of two weeks to discuss that. Um, so I think that's a good thing. I like pushing it back. Um, it's good. I mean, I think this one's going to be. Well, this one's an asterisk for you because you worked on the one two years ago. So you were you had your fingerprints on that one, but this is the first official without deputy. Cradle the grave. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, no, not grave. No, no. <laughs> not gonna, maybe a resurrection. No, no. Cradle, cradle to pedestal. <laughs> there we go. I like it. Cradle to pedestal. So okay. All right. That was just a disc uh, no, this was considered adopting. So here I'll let you do the motion. Okay. I will move. Uh, considering the adoption of the Isabella County fiscal year 2023 budget calendar as presented. And I will support that. Any further discussion? Hearing and seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed the same. That will go forward then to the next or the one of the next board meetings. Um, so next up, uh, the MERS annual actuarial valuation report discussion. So as you can tell from the staff report, <clears throat> excuse me, not asking for or requesting any action in this regard. I just simply um, wanted to make sure since this is a 
tremendously valuable benefit for a lot of our active employees and retirees, um, and certainly a, a large expense of the general fund. I just wanted to make sure that commissioners had a good um, understanding about what the report is. We do get this, this is just for our defined benefit pension, um, not at all for defined contribution. Remember, defined contribution, county puts in 7%, the employee based on their agreement either puts in two or 3%. We do have some unions that do the 3%. Um, and then that money goes in the market and with our well wishes for your retirement, right? That, that grows based on the market conditions. Defined benefit is more of a, we define the benefit you're gonna get in retirement because it's based on a formula and it doesn't matter what the market does that is the benefit that employees will earn. So I do wanna take a minute and make sure that we all understand how to arrive at what is the annual benefit for a defined benefit retirement. I did bring a nice little, I only have one of them so we can share if we need to, but that talks about at the very top line, how an annual defined benefit retirement benefit is calculated. We take your final average compensation, for most of our groups, that is the highest consecutive three years of your employment history with us. You multiply that by your service credit. That is how long you've worked for Isabella County. You earn service credit months at a time. And we have a definition of days of work. There's, I think it's you have to work 10 days out of the month to get credit for that. There's actually a definition for it. And then you multiply it by what's called the multiplier. And each of our six MERS defined benefit divisions have a multiplier associated with it. We'll get, as we walk through this report, I'll show you where to find that, that uh, those multipliers for each of our divisions. So that's, that's how we arrive at the benefit. In June of every year, we get this valuation report from MERS. They do hire an outside independent firm um, called um, GRS, Gabriel Broder Smith, I believe it is. And they do, they perform this actuary for MERS and it's based on our actual activity from the calendar year prior and some assumptions that MERS has built into place. So assumptions about our demographics, how long public employees live. It's, it's different than the private employee. The, the mortality tables are actually different for public than, than private. I won't tell you which way that goes. You can figure that out for yourself if that's a benefit or not. Um, it looks at investment assumptions. You know, what's going to be that rate of return on our investment? So we'll, we'll walk through that report and see how that affects us. Two big things that we get out of this report each year. What happened to our funding percent? Did it go up or down? That's a big part of this report. And then of course, what's our annual required contribution gonna be that we have to send to MERS every month to pay for this benefit. That's what this report tells us. We get it in June. This report is the latest one. It's from December 31st, 2020. And it provides us, so we got it in June of 21 and that provided us with the the amounts that we need in this year's budget. So starting um, that we, we will need in this year's budget starting October 1st. So we'll walk, we'll walk through that as well. Um, so do you guys have a printed one in front of you to walk through? This is helpful. I'm gonna walk through what I think is important. If I skip over pages where you guys have questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, there might be something important on, on a page that I missed. There might be questions from you that I certainly can't answer. This is some a pretty high level report, right? <clears throat> and if I can't answer them, I am more than happy to get someone from, from MERS in here to, to talk to you. In our audience, we have a couple of MERS experts, I would say. Um, so we can certainly we can certainly call on the resources in the room too. Free MERS experts. Yes, yes. Yeah, they, they won't get the <laughs> yes. bill of hours. So there you go. Yes. Well, Stevie might be. Yeah, <laughs> never mind. 
So I'm pretty sure we're already getting bills. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. In attendance, yeah. So it, it's, it's in a sense that's free. Steve can do that when he's sitting there. <laughs> yes. Two things at one time. Perfect. Yes, there exactly. we go. It's very efficient. So the first thing I, my eye always goes to when we get this report is page six. It looks like this, and that's our funding percent. It tells us what we do from last year to this year. So remember, this is calendar year report. So what this is telling us on page six is that from December 31st, 2019 to December 31st, 2020, our funding percent went from 75% to 72%. I think that's related to um, pay increases that we had and also the uh, interest value is that I do two factors I, I do I do feel like we did have some wage classification compensation that was implemented in 2020 so while the the full year remember the sheriff's department help me if I'm saying this wrong but I think the sheriff's department and PA were the first to come over um, they would be reflected, I think, um, fully implemented at this point. The rest went retro back to April of 2020. And so this doesn't represent a full year of that wage increase, but it certainly is built in here. And, and, and you'll see you'll see our investment income did fairly well. So I would I would think that what's driving that is the wage increases. One other quick question, and maybe I'm jumping the gun here. Um, with the fully funded, is that, let's say, for instance, um, I, I'm eligible for pension, if I'm in the pension program, but I'm not retired and I'm not either at a certain age or whatever. Vested not drawing. Vested not drawing. Does it make a difference how that affects the what you can, would consider to be fully funded? I mean, because I know we had a significant retirement of a court employee that would obviously probably would have a significant, I don't know if that would make a factor because and I don't know if that can skew the number either from dropping it from 1% it's down lower if you have an employee join the drawing part of it or not, or does it matter? Well, it depends on how good the actuaries do, right? Okay. Because the actuaries are presuming the age that that, that court employee gotcha. or whatever employee mm -hmm. is going to retire. So if they miss the mark on that, it, it could be good or bad. Well, I'll be honest, us, right? we had a sitting judge. Go out, I think 2020, 2019. Um, and obviously, I'm not going to speculate, but at the upper end of his probably the upper end of retirement, is he factored in or, or does the state fund some of his retirement too? How does that? Judges are special, right? Because they can either right. opt to take our retirement right. or the state retirement. Mm -hmm. So there is a chance that yeah. that judge was, right. was on. I, the I have state no idea. Yeah, I just saw, I just saw a, an increase of like with the court. There's chart coming up. I know I saw an increase of it was quite a significant jump of what their somebody went in and looks like addition. So I don't know if that was again based on their salaries increasing up that much, or was that somebody's retirement hitting that? I don't know. We can get it. It's second. probably the salaries, and, and we'll walk okay. through that. But I can tell you when the actuaries look at this, they look at active employees. They look at those mm -hmm. vested, not drawing. Right. Beneficiaries are a big piece of this, right? And that's, and that's you know, Jerry, you're smiling. I am. I'm smiling too. You know, I've got a defined benefit not here, but another place. Um, if you're married, then your spouse is automatically your beneficiary unless they're willing to sign off on that. If they're willing to sign off on that, you make your beneficiary whoever you want to. What is it now that carries on for? A it does with the defined benefit. I name my surviving beneficiary. After, and at the time I retire, I make a decision. I can do straight life, which is going to give me the, you know, the most benefit I can get until I die. But I can take a little hit in my retirement amount that I get monthly, and I can leave my daughter or my granddaughter as my beneficiary. Yes, that amount comes down because the actuaries know they're likely to live longer than me. But if I name my granddaughter as my beneficiary and I'm willing to take that cut at retirement and take a reduced amount, my granddaughter will receive that monthly reduced amount until she dies. Oh my God. That is I, why. I, I, that's what I'm. This I, that's is what, a tremendous benefit. Yeah, that's that's that In is part. that is a legacy uh, coming from the private sector who didn't have that. I just am, am again past promises made different different generations different but 
that needs to be known in the public. It needs to be known here. Yeah, it sure. needs to, because that is a legacy that it's, while, while on your end, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. On the person who writes the checks, it's the gift that keeps on, I don't want to say taking, that's not the proper term. That, that's a too negative. Requiring thing. funding. <laughs> it, it, it is something that requires it, it, it commitment and an ongoing commitment and a, and a legacy cost. And as we had discussed, again, I'm, I'm only on page six. So do want, I do want to get through this before hey, three o'clock today. But, you know, as we discussed before, I mean, the county, again, looking at two sides of it, on the one side, the county does not provide a medical part of retirement. That is, on the one side, as you're, if, if you're a retiree, that is negative. But on somebody who's responsible for a fiscal entity, that is a fund or funding or payment on the road, the legacy costs that we don't have to incur. So while well, I don't wanna make it sound like it's a, a negative for that legacy cost and it's not because obviously we wanted to have people that work and give their effort and maximum effort for the county and the county said that they would take care of them and they did, if they did that, that's what's yeah. happening. Now it's a whole different mechanism, not just on the public and public side, but now they're the private side it's coming over to the public side saying, you know, we can't, we can't afford that. So it's, it's very difficult. And, yes. and luckily your predecessors saw the writing on the wall right. 20 years ago and they closed our defined yep. benefit uh, divisions to new hires. New hires since then have been on the defined contribution where the county knows we're paying 7%, we're paying 7%, we're paying 7%. Yeah, I did not realize until I read this and I just insert the, the, the beneficiary status that was that was, oh, I mean, you mentioned you could, you could. I didn't know that either. I didn't know you could designate another person besides your spouse. And understand the actuaries know mm -hmm. that, you know, you can't, yeah. you can't Look get, yeah, you can't get this amount of retirement until your granddaughter dies, right? But so they, they adjust that and you make that decision at the time of retirement. But yes, that's a. That's so a you're setting thing. up basically a trust fund for uh, we've been Retirement beneficiary trust fund. In that if that's the choice you make at retirement right. time, yeah. and, and, and that is it's not really necessarily a trust choice. fund name, but similar yes. to it. Yes. You know? Yes. I have a quick question before we move on. Oh. Yeah. Is there an average uh, across the state for funded? I, I'm sure there's some entities that are greater than 75, or I think Clinton County on left was 100 percent, if I remember correctly, that's and some are worse. Yeah, you 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 got it. Is I, there an average? I'm sure that we can find out the, what the average is or, or even the mean, but I, know how we're doing. I can tell you when you get below 60% funded, that's when the state kind of says uh, what's, what's going on here. We'll get to the point in the back of the report where uh, MERS gives us the information we need to, re to satisfy the new state reporting requirements for Hey County, what position funded are you? Where are you sitting with your, your defined benefit pension? And so this report gives us the information to speak to that. And I, I believe as long as you're over that 60% funded, you just keep going about your business. I think if you get under 60%, then, then Treasury, Treasury will have to take us through. The chairman, I think there might be a Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Just, just throw something at me or please, something. Please, well, please. So part of the things you the people that we are hybrid so we are on youtube so this is the speaker that would pick you up here yeah, a couple of things that you want to realize with the, the MERS process, process that we've done we, we realized back when we went to the uh, defined contribution that the pool now shrinks <laughs> into defined mm -hmm. benefits mm -hmm. and we didn't take advantage of we took advantage of the savings. I mean, we're paying 11% and 12% on some of these groups that we have based on their ages and the times they're gonna retire. We didn't take advantage of putting some monies aside to put it into the MERS for the defined contribution portion. And that's why your, your portions go down, 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 down. Um, three of our units, uh, Medical Care Facility, Commission on Aging, or I mean, Road Commission and ICTC, I believe are 100% funded. And the benefit of that being higher funded is, as a county treasurer, I can tell you the interest rates are terrible for us to hang on to money and invest it 
and then pay. If we do have some funds that we put into the MERS, I mean, they're averaging seven and a half percent over there. They mentioned that putting it into an overfunded account so you can yes. build it up and then you can transfer it yeah. out. Yeah. So uh, in, uh, we talked uh, seven years ago about uh, when we had a higher fund balance and things, putting a million dollars in a straight shot. And that million dollars at 7% is going to make a lot of your payments and it's going to help you keep up with your inflation. Now, I mean, that's on you guys, whatever you guys are going to do on that. But um, the higher you're funded, um, the more money you're going to get in return, which is kind of a cost savings to you, even though it's going to cost you money up front. Um, the other thing is you got to look at is if you want to do anything with your retirees at any point in time, I think there's a threshold there that you have to be at in order to be able to pass the, the ease or whatever they are that's there as, as well. You can't. If you're underfunded by their standards, I don't think they allow you to pass that for there. Um, most of the averages that I've seen, Jerry, when I go to the um, convention, so, and I didn't get an opportunity to go this last year, um, had some conflicts. Um, uh, they're in the, in the upper 70s, okay? Now, there are a lot of borderlines, okay? 70s and 80% are where the majority of them stay. But again, most of them take, like Clinton and a few of the other ones, take advantage of staying funded up. Um, so when you do have your inflation raises, those kind of things that come up, the cost of living and stuff, it, it doesn't eat into your banks. It helps maintain your level of, uh, of uh, so it's, it's no different than you run your own family finances. I and mean, you're not going to sit there and keep, I'm going to throw a number, $150,000 in your checking account that gains 0.1%. When you can shift out a hundred grand and put it in uh, even a three to five percent sure safety thing, it's generating it's five percent low hanging fruit money, and it's your money. It's Correct. still your money. Okay. And if you did something like in your example, say we put it into one that's a hundred percent, one of the given examples of how to do that, we can access that. Can't we? Can't we pull it back out? Or not, once you put it in, you can't pull out. I, I don't know that you can pull out. You cannot appropriate later on. Okay. Uh, for it, which we, you know, if you need to uh, ship cash, a dollar, right? You can yeah. you know, pay your payment per yeah. But per the future day. value of a dollar at, at MERS is a lot better than the future value of a dollar in our savings. That makes. I, I don't. Um, that that was, to be honest, I mean, I've, I've been. This is my ninth, tenth year, tenth year, tenth year. I never knew that, and I will honestly say I did not know that was a possibility. Yeah. Well, it, it was so, brought up. Uh, originally, I think when, when Roger was here, Roger Trudell was the yeah. commissioner. Um, we talked about it, and there were some things that were going to get done. That, yeah, that, was, that was one of the options that we we really all agreed on. But yeah, it that, just, that is something as we go forward, just not here. But I mean, you look at uh, I'm going to digress just for a minute. If you look at most counties, and and money, it had a big big project to the north with the turbine money. You know, we'd be talking not turbine money <laughs> doing this. We can't. We, right. we, we have a big source. Now we've got to go to alternative ways. I think Commissioner Hope, Chairman Hope, has, has one profit, one idea he wants to proffer maybe down the road. Um, but that's what makes perfect sense. I mean, if you know you, you've got a set expense, you know that you're going to have to pay this. You're going to have to pay it. Yep. And, you know, you don't want to totally drain your fund balance to pay it. You know. Yeah, and, and the big thing, like I said, you're having right. a... Uh, you, you, your pool keeps getting smaller. So mm -hmm. the amount of people that are paying into that pool, because we do pay a difference between our um, V2 to V4. So the sheriff's only pay V3 to V4, but uh, we do pay a portion in there. Right. Um, and our pools get smaller, smaller, smaller as we retire, which means there's more draw, draw, draw on it. Um, Death is our only alternative that gets us out of the. Uh, out of this. <laughs> According to Nicole, <laughs> unless they give it to their kids. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nicole was 100% correct on. They take, if you're going to give it to a 15 year old they, kid, they actuarialize. They, they, yeah, they, they slaughter you. I mean, yeah. I shouldn't say slaughter, but they they adjust According. very lucrative to, towards. Uh, uh, you you missed, you came in late, you missed that lecture they gave you about saying certain words. I know. The George Carlin thing. That's slaughter. No, no, no. Slaughter's probably number 11, not I, I don't. I don't mean slaughter. I mean, <laughs> I'm it, joking. It's uh, the benefits are more towards us than it mm -hmm. is towards uh, that. And, and even with you uh, taking, you know, 100% for yourself, and then if you die, 100% for your spouse, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big, that's a fairly good penalty too. 
um, opposed to an 80% or another percentage. But, yeah. And, and for the audience that's watching, uh, I did not introduce him. That's just Steve Pickens, I'm our sorry. county treasurer. So I did not hear I called you up and just said Steve. I'm sorry. Thank you. So there you no, go. Thank, thank, thank you. That was a great explanation. Thank you very much. All right. Really sorry. Was. Let's get no, to page this seven. Is good stuff. Let's get this page is seven. good stuff. Let's get I do want to say yeah. accountant Chris Whitmer just texted me average funding percent for calendar year 2020 in Michigan was 70%. So we're, so we're still, okay. above, still above, above average. We're C plus students. Ouch. So no, I shouldn't yes. say that. Everyone gets a C grade, so we're B students. So yes, page seven. Um, this is where this tells us how much money are we going to have to send to MERS. Remember, we we got this last June, in June of 2021. In this, if you look in this, um, you're all on that table. If you look over to that. Um, Phase in 1231 2020. It's a fiscal year beginning October 1, 2022. So, what we will need October 1 of this year for fiscal 23 is what these numbers provide us in the actuary. So, when we get it this June, and if it goes up, we don't have to panic, right? We've got some time to build that into the budget. MERS knows you can't turn right around and and make changes that quick. So it, they're always ahead of the game with this report. And these are, as uh, Treasurer Pickens noted, he talked about medical care facility. You'll notice on those divisions on this table to the left, division four, division 40 and 41, those start out MCF, those are all medical care facility uh, divisions. They, they fall under our umbrella. Um, as we go through some of these, you'll also see because they are so well-funded, they're kind of lifting us up a little bit, right? Because they are included in our funding percentage. As Treasurer Pickens also talked about employee contribution rates, employees are contributing to this benefit and you can see that table on that page as well, the different divisions um, that we have and what they are paying. I do have um, Ms. Kneeport and payroll um, verifying that what employees are paying is, you know, per per the collective bargaining agreements per per policy to make sure that is right. As Treasurer Pickens also mentioned, I wasn't going to dive into this, but I'm really glad he did. MERS strongly encourages employers to contrib contribute more than our minimum um, contribution every year, and and he nailed it as to why they they uh, they have. Even during 2008, I think they outperformed everybody else, right? Their, their, their 10 year average, I think is still up around 12%. Just, just phenomenal, so phenomenal. We, our last meeting, phenomenal. we got presented all the bank accounts that our money's in and you know, they're not, yeah, they're, they're hitting squat. That's number, that's, I my, squat might be number 12. Yeah, shaking no <laughs> back there. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. Uh, yeah. Squat yeah. might be word number 12, I can't say. So. Yeah. So there, um, did you want to say No, something? go ahead. Okay. We talked about um, why these numbers change. And on page eight, it does talk about changes in benefit provisions can make, make the numbers change, changes in actuarial assumptions um, and actual experience, right? That's why we have this, that's why we have this valuation each year. Does someone's spouse sign that form and they choose a beneficiary, you know, that does someone pass? Those things affect um, every, you know, our actual activity affects. Something that obviously has a huge impact on this report is what MERS um, investment rate assumption is. And they did recently change that. And it is now at 7.35%. And we'll see some tables as to what if it's less than that? What if it comes in less than that? I did also know on PG that does talk about them updating demographic and some assumptions. Again, this is in terms of um, mortality, retirement, um, disability, and termination rates. They just they, they make collective assumptions about public employers that they that the actuarials apply to this. This next one is kind of a it's a hard concept to get your, your mind around sometimes, but MERS does something called asset smoothing. And they do this to avoid 
what they call dramatic spikes and dips in our annual contributions. We don't want one year to be paying $3 million and the next year to be paying a quarter of a million dollars, right? So in short-term fluctuations, this is actually smooths things out. Right now they do a five-year smoothing. And that means like when 2008 happened, right? MERS didn't make counties pay for that all at once or, or the other ministers, I shouldn't just say counties, their members, they smoothed that out over time so that each, and I think that was a 10 year, eight, eight or 10 year smoothing back then because it was so severe. Each year you took like a 10th of that hit and so for 10 years, you would feel that impact, but you wouldn't feel the impact all up at once, right? So they do smooth it. And in this case, um, if um, they say, if the December 31, 2020, if this valuation results were based on market value instead of actuarial value, we'd actually be at 74% instead of 72% because we performed fa fairly well that year, but they smoothed it out, okay? Does that make sense? So that you, they do it in the bad years and in the good years. Yeah. Um, our total employer contribution requirement um, fiscal year starting October 1 would be 2.8 million instead of the 3 million we're looking at. I don't want to concern you with those numbers because again, medical care facility is built in there. On page 10, we follow this investment return assumption of the 7.35%. It gives you a table of, okay, at 7.35%, our total employer contribution is 255,000 a month. Again, it's gonna be less than that because medical care is built into these numbers. 72% funded. What if we have a 6.35% return instead of a 7.35% return like was assumed? Well, then our funded ratio goes down to 64% and we're sending 339,000 a month. God forbid, what if it went down to 5.35%? You can see the effect on our funded ratio and what we would have to pay in. So it was a big to-do when MERS lowered their um, investment return assumption um, because it, it has a direct impact on the assets uh, of, our, of our plan. Pretty major impact. Yes, it can. Yes, yeah. so we need to, need to understand that. And then the next page, page 11, shows what, um, again, at the 7.35, 6.35, and 5.35%, what our funding percentage would do. Again, just walking through what I just told you, but it kind of goes, goes forward in, in other years. Our percentage funded is intended in the way we, we make our annual payments. Our percentage funded is intended to keep going up, right? That's our goal keep going up, up, up. Page 12 shows you um, a couple of graphs. One is our funded percentage, which we wanna keep going up, up, up. The other is our estimated annual employer contribution, which we want to go down, down, down. We know from the scenario that MERS presented us a few years ago and we agreed to, we're gonna have some high defined benefit annual contributions and they're gonna fall off in the late 20, 28, 29, 20, 30 in there, they should fall off. And that those tables show you that. Page 13, this is uh, employer contribution details for fiscal year beginning October 1, 2022. And this just shows you, in the middle, it shows you employer normal cost. That is if we were all paid up. That's what Clinton County has, right? That's the activity for the year. Next, sorry, what, what, um, page 13, 13 for looking gotcha. at that, yep, that gotcha. table. That next column is payment of your unfunded accrued liability. Because we're not 100% funded, that's the additional payment that we need to make. And so that comes out to the, the total payment that we will, we will, um, we will have monthly and then annually. But I just wanna show you the normal employer cost, estimated annual contribution about 326,000. Wouldn't it be nice to budget for that? And then the unfunded accrued liability adds 2.7 million to our annual payment. And we have the, we, we opted into this phase in, again, it's kind of that smoothing thing. So where you see the, the with phase in and without phase in, we do the with phase in 
it provided us a little more smoothing in that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the column you would follow there. I just want to make the, the point of what, what that unfunded accrued liability um, is costing us. And again, we have no choice, right? That's, that's the, the promise made. Benefit provisions for each division start on page 15. This is where I told you you can find that benefit multiplier for each of the divisions. Really nice little history here of what's the normal retirement age for that division. Um, what's the vesting requirement? How long do you have to work for us before you're vested? What's early retirement age? Um, is final average compensation based on three or five years? All of this stuff tells you right here. Do they get a cost of living allowance for future retirees? What does that mean by non-compound? Is that like I think it means? To explain it. Explain what when it says cost of living for current return, 2.5% non-compounded. Does that mean it's just as a one-time payment of 2.5% based on their retirement? Or? I believe so. Yes. Yes. Where I, I don't think that it does it go on? Does it continue? Is that what you're? Yeah, is does that non count This non compounded to me means that it, it, it adds on every year. So you get 2.5 this year, and then next year the 2.5 is included in your base, and you get another 2.5. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that, I don't know what that means. Is that? I, I will check on that to be sure because when we brought the, the cost of living request from that retiree group, it seems to me there were not a lot of ongoing cost of living increases. There were some one time that we had granted, but there weren't a lot of retirees that, that had that ongoing, which to me, non-compounding is a one time. Do you know that, Steve? Well, Nicole, the date, the date that you do the cost of living for retirees, you only have those that are there at that time. So any other retirees that happen after the fact, it broke goes away. So as these people pass away, then that amount stays. It goes away. So any new retirees after you issue a cost of living next year, they're not on that list. Gotcha. And there is a now that I look deeper, there is a for current rates cola for current retirees and cola for future retirees. And the only ones we have for future are and it depends deputies. on which way you do it. Two different benefits. One you can do a reoccurring year, one you can do a one-time. Mm -hmm. You did the one-time. Okay. Thank you. So this goes this goes through all of our divisions. Um, page eighteen gives a nice table of participant summary and. This goes through our divisions and how many active employees. It's a great picture of how many are, are still in the defined benefit working, how many vested former employees, and how many retirees and beneficiaries do we have? Is GNRL, are those non union? It always has GNRL in court. Yes, um, so I have to go to my cheat sheet because the names of these are so terrible, right? Um, yes, that 01 general court is actually the non represent on all non represented employees. So they could be some court employees too, right? That, that don't fall under the GELC. That next one is of corrections, Division Two is for corrections officers. Um, yep, number four is not ours, that's medical care. Division 10 that says general other is actually um, central dispatch employees. That's our uh, dispatch supervisors and dispatchers, telecommunicators, apologies. Uh, group 11 is our trial court uh, represented, those in the governmental employees labor council. Uh, division 20 is our deputies and 21s are our command officers. 40 and 41 again are, are uh, medical care. Thank you. Yeah, we'll work to get those division names updated so Nicole, that they're Nicole, actually meaningful. Nicole, what group? Um, I know we had a group come in front of us uh, or sent some information seeking a cost of living adjustment. What group did they fall under here? That was at 01 General. 01 General. Okay. The, the, our large, that's our largest. So when it says court, it's not necessarily. 
Right. It's okay. actually non-represented employees. Okay. So all right. Any, That's what was strong. Any, me. Where any DB it? from admin or drains or treasurer's okay. office or parks or okay. anyone not in a not in a collective bargaining unit. Okay. Thank you. And again, we'll work to get those division names updated. I think MERS can make that change so that the report is just going to be more valuable that way, right? We know what we're looking at. Oh, let's see. Lots of information here. We will go through, let's go through to page 22. This is where we come up with that, how much unfunded accrued liability do we have, right? So they look at those groups of active employees and the cost associated with that. They looked at the vested former employees, cost associated with that retirees and beneficiaries and what the current draw is. So you see those columns and pending refunds. I'm really not sure why there would be refunds. I, I think from time to time, they, they audit timesheets or someone retires and, and they don't think they don't have the service credit they thought they did. So they'll go back and, and we'll go, Oh, yep. Here's, here's proof that they get another couple months of, of service credit, that kind of thing. So it could be good, it could be bad. Sometimes we um, report sick pay in, in the final average compensation and that's a no-no, right? So when we discover that, that has to be backed out. So refunds, I think, can be positive or negative in that regard. But all of that comes to total liability of just under $73 million, right? For the actuaries that know active employees, former vested and current retirees, 73 million. But it also um, puts a value on our assets with MERS, the payments that we do send them, just about a little over 52 million. That's where we get that 72% funded. In that percent funded column, you can see how medical care facility is helping us because one division is 90% funded, one division is 83% funded, and one division is oddly 365% funded. So that, that is in our funding percentages. And then of course, do the math, assets minus liabilities, or in this case, liabilities minus assets, we're $20 million unfunded. Um, that's our unfunded accrued liability. Page 20. So we're at 20. Million six fifty one eight seventy seven is our total unfunded right now. Yes. So my why did I have like thirteen or sixteen in my head? Was that like two years ago? Yes, or? because when they came, when MERS came to right. us and said, "Would you like to do something different?" Right. I thought it was at sixteen or fourteen. I mean, thirteen is too long. I don't know that. I uh, actually, you are darn near spot on. So. I have from the, if we think back, December 31st, 2017 valuation, we were 80% funded. In 2018, we went down to 79% funded. In December 31st, 2018, our unfunded accrued liability was 13 million. You're spot on with your memory. That's what 13, it was okay, 13, when, okay. when MERS came to us and said, here's a, here's a, a scenario of, Smoothing out, smoothing out your payments, basically, and, and not having those spikes. Uh, I have a question. If um, I know we're looking at the bond for the jail, but is it possible to bond for this amount? And is there an advantage that we might gain in terms of uh, uh, lesser cost per year going in that direction rather than? I think, I think that we're jumping the gun. I think, but I think Commissioner Chairman, Chairman Hope was talking about doing some bond. Well, I, I had read that they did that in Grand Traverse County, and I was interested in that. That was one of the options that we talked about. So you could bond that, let's say, a three percent, and you put it that money, and it was seven percent. I mean, and you are four percent. They, whatever you put in there, is going to give you that seven percent, whatever you have. Uh, I know there's, they, a there's a risk. There's, there's your bond there's, issue of three percent or whatever. There's a risk involved. Still, that's not part free of, money. Part of the tough part okay. is with the first thing is when they change their actuarials and assumptions and stuff. 
they were on a 20 year basis, okay? And they said for each year that we're going to go, we're going to drop another year. So it, it's like a house payment. If you take a, two years off your house payment, the payment's going to be higher. So that, that's part of the reason that we also increase and lower our, our percentage of our rates of fit. Um, the bonding issue was an option but along with taking out the general fund that million dollars I talked about. And uh, we chose, I guess, chose not to do that. But yeah, bonding is, a, is, a, is a available. Mm -hmm. And we're looking into that because of Chairman's comments to me. I did reach out to our financial advisor and um, put the team together because our defined benefit pension divisions are closed to new hires. It, it does allow us to bond for those. And so, and because our bond rating is, we're, we're in good standing. So I think that's a requirement as well. So in order to bond for pension unfunded accrued liability, you need a financial advisor, bond counsel, and actually an underwriter because these as I understand, don't go out to the market. They're actually a placement. So you negotiate a placement with the bank and that, that takes a, for a lender and that takes an underwriter. So I did pull them together. The first step was getting basically a new one of these from MERS, a new valuation report that's more up to date. And so that's been ordered uh, from MERS. It doesn't cost anything to do that, but um, that is underway and it'll take some time. So once that comes back, People a lot smarter than me will look at those numbers and decide, does it make sense? Because what Treasurer Pickens has talked about, they did, we used to remortgage every year, our, our MERS payment, we just kicked the can down the road. And a while ago, MERS says, nope, those are, those are closed. The amortization now, now shrinks. So each year we have a, a year less to, to pay that liability off. Those people aren't smarter than you. They're just more dialed into this particular. <laughs> they just have a bigger spreadsheet, right? Right, Steve? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, they look at. The, I love numbers. They, they look at this page and stay there an hour. I look at that page and it's still like this. Give me some, <laughs> some aspirin. Yeah. yeah. Somebody tell me what I need to know. I mean, okay. Well, so and that's just, what I'm I, trying to I'm do. On, I'm on camera. <laughs> So I'm just going to follow this little exercise through December 31st of 2018. Then we were at 79%. So when we got the 2019 valuation, we found out we were at 75%. Our, U, our UAL, our unfunded accrued liability, had risen to just over 16 and a half million. Um, and then, of course, um, from the 19 to 20, you see we went from 75% to 72%, and now at 20 million. Um, yeah, but that that, that 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 looks like a in that, just to look if you take a snapshot of that boom, I think you're you know oh my lord we went from we went from seventy nine to seventy two and down eight million dollars but we pushed it out so we wouldn't have a three to four million dollar hit mm -hmm. on our so that one side is going to go up and our other side is going to go down but then hopefully eventually we can pick that back up down the road. I mean, they might, is that a correct assumption? I, I, how to, I how hope so. I mean, because our in the same in the same time, our our assets have gone up $10 million in the mm -hmm. same time. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's not it's not all one sided. All right, no. So yeah, we, we we spread it out so we wouldn't have that big. It's like taking a 10 year mortgage versus a 20 year mortgage. You're gonna pay more, but if you take 20, you pay less, but you owe more. I mean, does that make that's that's how I I, I gotta you know, my head, $20 million, that's, that, that is a significant figure. And, yes, sir. And again, if we, we'd be having a whole different round square table discussion here, if we could use those funds from up there for this, but we can't. So now we got to figure out playing with our general, bu general fund budget. That's where you come in, trying to tie all this together. And how do we maintain our three-year plan, our five-year plan, our 10-year plan, our 20-year plan, <clears throat> when you're looking at 22.5, three million million every year in you know, a legacy cost. And that's, 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 again, not unique to Isabella County. We're not no. in rarefied air here. No. I mean, but it is, it is a situation where, I, you know, we know it, I think, finding out more and more every day, every hour, every minute. Um, but, it's 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 a problem. It's going to be a problem. Not a problem. It's 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 a 
budgetary issues. Yes, yes. And it's probably a large percentage of the budget. Right now, it's 10% of our budget or 8% of our That's budget. That's a great way to look at it. And I and thank you for letting me share this with you because I should be the only one that knows this. Well, it's, we an, it's this. well, yeah, because this, this is, this is a sleepless moments for you and that you don't, you know, seven hours sleep is now six hours for you <laughs> <laughs> because of 8%, you know, so, <laughs> right, right. you know, exactly. and especially when you started yes. your timeline, you got to figure out how are we going to pay that $2.5 million or whatever, 2.8, you know, three, one. Um, that's, uh, yeah, it's, and we've known that. We've known that, but yeah, it's, it's, again, I don't want to digress. I want to go beyond page 23 here, but um, I just, I just look at that, you know, looking at just how we drop, but again, I can, I can see a reason for that drop, mm -hmm. but at the same yeah. time, yeah, and you MERS, got, it's not just uh, ours. Like right, you got to fat, you, 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 got, you, you, you got to, changes. you got to pay that. So that's that's the whole thing. You you don't have a you know there's no failure is not an option. Correct. So okay. Correct. Promises made. Promises so. kept. Um, basically, the next few pages go through each division and show you you know based on the valuation date what the funding percentage has done um, where the UAL is at. So that's the next several pages um, a page for each division there. So we are barreling forward now. Let's go to um, starts on page 23, and this is the, the amortization schedules. And you can see how it used to be a rolling amortization. Basically, every year we everybody got to take out a new mortgage on their on their pension payment uh, to MERS. But a while ago they stopped that. We closed those. And um, now, now they shrink. And so these tables show you basically the payments that would have to be made over that remaining amortization period to, to pay off the liability. So we go to page 42. Um, this is the GASVI number 68 information, the auditor's Love this stuff. Doesn't mean a ton to me, but it's just kind of a summary of. It's a nice. It's a nice snapshot of, as of December 31, how many employees were covered by this benefit, how many belly buttons, if you will. Inactive employees or beneficiaries currently receiving benefits. Again, I'm on page 42. 240. Inactive employees that are vested but not drawing. 78 actually outnumbers the number of active employees we had at the time in defined benefit, which was 76. So 394 um, souls impacted by this um, as of December 31st, 2020. Change in total pension liability. Here's where we talked about, hmm, why would these numbers change? What would impact that? Benefit changes, zero, zero impact. Differences between expected and actual experience, 1.3 million. Changes in assumption on MERS part, 2.8 million. So now it brings it right into perspective for you what's causing these changes. MERS let us know they were making those changes. They let everybody know that they were, that these changes were coming. They have for years have been telling us they're coming, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming next year, they're coming next year, they're here, they're here. They've been telling us. On page 43, um, not this, this, I just love this report. There's so much information in here. By division, it gives you a history, a timeline of everything that's happened formally with these divisions. When there might have been a COLA adopted, um, when there was um, a change from, you know, those multipliers, I think there's a B1, B2, B3, B4. It, the, the MERS um, multipliers range from, I think, half a percent to two and a half percent, I believe. So based on your, your B level, your multiplier changes. So you can look through the histories and see when, when these groups adopted um, the, their different level of benefits in each of the divisions. As you look through there, you might wonder what Act 88 is. There is, MERS recognizes MERS service in other counties, which you're probably familiar with, Commissioner, I would imagine. 
Um, but they also, Act 88, please correct me if I'm wrong, recognizes not only MERS service at another public employer, government employer, but it recognizes non-MERS service at another government employer. Um, I believe that's what the Act 88 does. And that's been adopted by all of those divisions. So basically that helps you, not in your pension benefit, it wouldn't increase your years of service with us, but it could in terms of vesting. If you had service from another governmental entity that wasn't MERS and you were here in a DB in a defined benefit, you could use that for, um, for the vesting. And I, I did that uh, because I had time with uh, other government entities. I had CMU, I taught as a associate professor for seven semesters and community college downstate and all came into a number of years I claimed. Okay, great. This is teaching me something. So it's not just governmental, it must be public. It's any public uh, pension that you don't withdraw your pension assets from. Gotcha. It can be military or government. Okay. Services. Okay. So it can be a, a trust purchase. I think we used to do up to five years. So you could actually pay for service credit, right? And that bumps up that equation we're talking about. Me coming from a private organization, I couldn't count my services sure. as an accountant, but I could count them. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that distinction. Um, page 50, this is um, a very small table, but very important. Uh, this is one of those assumptions that MERS makes in the valuation. They assume increase in final average compensation across all divisions would be 2%, right? So that's an annual that and on an average, our wages would increase 2% a year, right? The actuaries have to put some kind of assumption on that. They assume our wages will increase 2% per year. So again, to the implementation of the classification and wage study, collectively, I think we can say it was likely greater than 2%, likely greater than the assumed. Again, that'll go back to that activity, that actual activity of our plan having an impact on, on our standing. Ooh. I think, I think that I'm done with my part. And so now, thank you again for sitting through that. Hope you found it very valuable. Um, if you have questions for me, I will entertain those. If you have questions for MERS, I will get them in there. Mr. Jelzinski, any questions? Steve, are you going to incorporate this in your uh, projections for the uh, finance theory deal? Yes, sir. <laughs> I guess that was I'm my, satisfied. I guess I was hoping you have anything. No. I guess I get the, again pointing that to Steve. Can we see, as a commissioner, I guess now I want to see when does this legacy go away. I mean, how far out are we to removing this? And what is our, is it 20 years, 15 years? I mean, our spreadsheet was that year, I don't know what year it was, or we continued on not to pay that. Was that 2026? I think it was 20 years. Let me find it. I think I brought it. Um, you're talking about when the, when MERS presented when, us. When, yeah, when we had our, when we had our MERS legacy payment going away, but we were budgeting that to pay off the debt to the jail. Was that 2026, 2020? 2028, 2028. I wanna, I wanna okay. say it was right. what the All spreadsheet right. showed. So where, at, um, where is that projection and how is that projection now changed based right. on these five year new numbers? And I know it's gonna change. I, I said that mm -hmm. right along. Those were just, mm -hmm. you know, those are best, not best guess. That's, we don't wanna use the term guess. Estimate, that's always a great deal. We estimate, we guess, I mean, I, I, yeah. but, where, how has that changed? Because that's a, that's a, when we've had this discussion, I'm saying it publicly now. It, how's that changed? And how are we going to address that? When I say we, 
speak more about that one. Um, um, you know, how is that going to be addressed? Because you have to be right up front, transparent and everything with that. You have to sit there and say, this is what we're doing. And, you know, we're trying to, we sat last Friday at a, you know, at a, at a rectangular table, long one actually, um, or, you know, or not tangled, but anyway, um, and, and, and try to sit there with these new numbers and there it's, it is a, it is a not a moving goalpost situation. We got to define the goalposts. We got to figure out how far we got to stay back and kick it. And we like to kick a little, kick little field goals and then yeah. or a little extra points. Not, you know, long shots. Yeah, the guy from Baltimore kicking the sixty-six yarder. You don't like those, so because uh, those don't always go through. So um, yeah, that's how I. That's what I'd like to see is working. At, again, I don't expect to see anything set in stone, and that's how we're going to live off of. But you got to be consciously aware of that yeah. yes. quarterly presentations every six months presentations to the board i mean when i say to the board that's out to the public they need to know that's it's a big yes. and again like i said that's a big part of our budget and, and that um our jail debt coming up that's a big part how we manage that we learned the other day that you know to do with the jail you want to go sooner rather than later because that's dollar amounts that possibility just even a few fluctuations in a little bit of interest rates or millions of dollars and, and treasurer Pickens stated putting this away or uh, chairman hope going out and bonding getting some money and we got to do that it's no longer hey we're just living off our revenues and we can make it no problem we got a large fund balance well those that that plan hasn't worked so this is phase b not a hard plan not a difficult situation just better ma better management not not nothing, you know, when I say management, not better management. It's, it's a different way of management. Maybe not better, but different. And more more in tune with what we have to do and what's out there. So that's all I've got. I said, no, that's easy for me to say. Or, you know, I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and, so, we, and we will do it. And, and yeah. uh, Steve Kronovic is prepared, um, will be prepared to walk through the three-year forecast um, at the next finance meeting. Uh, and we will be incorporating the knowns into that, all of the knowns. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing I wanted to do is, is to get you thinking about this report that's going to come out this June, right? Mm -hmm. That'll be our, our roadblocks, not roadblocks, our, our, our roadmap mm -hmm. <laughs> going oh, forward. Little, yep. little I, I appreciate that. Well, my, I knew it came out in Clinton County when I, I sat in some of their board meetings and they discussed it. They had the report that... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first time maybe the finance committee had it in the past, but I hadn't seen it through the county. I don't, I don't remember seeing it. May I again? I, 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 I yeah, it, it, and we may have, it might have just been so. So you will be getting it going forward, and as well, we get quarterly reports of how our defined benefit um, investments are doing. The quarterly show where we started the quarter. The, the benefits paid, the contributions we've made, the investments, whether we've had a gain or loss that quarter and our standing. So I can start to share those with you when they come out quarterly as well. I just, you know, that, that's good to know. I don't want to overly panic. No, no. Because I, I, as somebody who doesn't have a pension on their retirement, somebody who is to find contribution, as we say, I've learned not to look at my account as much because sometimes I feel like I, oh, maybe I don't have to work till I'm, you know, 75 or something like that. And then I look at some other days, I see the market drop. I go, oh, I mirror the market. I'll be 80 I before I, I get it. Yeah, I'll be 80. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, I got to drink whatever, I got to eat whatever Joe Zinsky's eating because he seems to be making it. So I gotta I'm in the same contain. defined contribution. Oh, yeah, yeah, you kind of, yeah, you, just, so. you just train yourself not to. Don't look. Don't look. And I, and that's I hate to say that. Look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you look. Tell me, tell me. Just shake your head. Oh. So, yeah. That's why the, the 457, the deferred compensation plan that you guys just approved for mm -hmm. all employees is important to give those that don't have a true pension, if you will, another bucket to use in your retirement. All right. and, and the commissioners are, are eligible for the 457. I'll talk about that at Tuesday's meeting. Okay. Um, anything else on that, gentlemen? Anything? Any more questions for Nicole? Let me know as it as you uh, maybe 
revisit this or if you if something pops into your mind just please yeah i'll i'll i you know i read the book but when we got to some of those tables i kind of started going oh i'm gonna have oh, to wow. explain that to me <laughs> yeah, <laughs> i mean you know like i tried your pick and said taking some of the funds over getting it getting and getting your money into a seven and a half Good way to do it because you said before you have to be careful where you put our money. And turn to the second tickets as I do that. Um, be careful where you put your money. You just can't go play the stock market and count money. Right? I'm, assuming, I'm assuming you can't do that. Go to, go to the casino and put it on the rack. Okay, you can't do that. But if you can, if you can find something that you can, 7.5%. You know. So is MERS held in the same uh, uh, requirements as uh, a local government, county government, in terms of their investment? No, they could invest for avocado farms. Yeah. The birds used to be part of the state of Michigan. Really? Yeah. And they bought their branch off 20 years ago out of their own thing. No, they're not held. So I heard the word risk. So if you do something like that. There's still risk. I mean, their assumptions before was 8% a year, you know, 2.5% raises per year, and there's one other one there. They have since rolled those back. Uh -huh. more reasonable because they have hit 8% away or 9, 10, you know, during that period of time. Uh, we'd love to 10 year average it so that yeah. because of the way the market goes, it's just over all. But yeah, it's, I think it's a 7.3 now or something that their assumptions are, and the races are quite as high assumption. So, anyway, that's a variable that if you don't average 2% races a year, those uh, uh the provisions gotcha. okay thank you all right um probably what we'll probably do in the future too since we're getting more interactive which is good i think whoever we have speak from the audience i should probably bring up that way we can no no that's me too uh, that's not you no that's great it's, it's good information so that's probably the way to do it. So well, it, it does appear well, that Treasurer Pickens has had some really good input the last few finances. Yeah. Maybe he would just like to join us at the table. I would not be opposed to that. If good idea. Uh, so why don't we? Yeah. Uh, anyway, let's go to the invoice list discussion. All right. Commissioner Jelzinski, anything on the invoice list discussion? I didn't see anything. But Chairman Hope? Nope, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Steve, uh, Treasurer Pickens, if you come up here real quick, if you don't mind, real quick. I have a quick question. It was asked before the meeting, so I'll ask you. Um, I didn't have anything really, but with the shop co, is that is that the big box payment that they didn't want to pay the big box? I know they're out of business up there now and everything, but the, the discount back to them. What was what was the? I know that we've had issues with. Uh, oh, uh, tax tribunal. Yes, uh, tax. We do have tax tribunals that come in, and you know they make the decision, and we have to pay back. So we have to. What we do is we pay out of the delinquent tax revolving fund. That we collect from the local units, but we have to pay that out within so many days. Mm -hmm. Is that because of the like they're big, they, they're, they can't get rentals for that space? Well, the big box the, area, black whatever box, the reason the tribunal store. has uh, established okay. that okay. Uh, um, a, a lot of the things that we're experiencing right now is the rentals. Um, rentals have a, a little bit better leeway where they can be based on their occupancy rate as well. Um, and we know that we've been virtual, a lot of the school stuff's been virtual. So the last couple of years, the accuracy rates for those are down, way down. And uh, so they're going to the tribunals and to get their assessments lower. And to okay. lower their assessments. And out of that lower of assessments, um, we have to pay out and give back, you know, for, for the years that they, they grant. Uh, the tough part is, is if it was to take off again and we get by this uh, COVID stuff, that can only be raised a certain percentage by the consumer price index. Um, so to catch up to where they may have been, it may take you a period of time uh, to get there because there are limitations going forward that way. So no limitations going back, but going forward. Well, the limitations going back is go to the tribunal and, and get reassessed. Gotcha. If your assessor won't, you know, gotcha. redo it. But, okay. yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Yep. That was it for me on the discussions. So I just had a question on that. Um, that next brings us up to call to the public. Turn it ahead. I know Treasurer Pickens don't want to speak. He's stuck with us. Anything? Okay, great. A call to the virtual. Anything 
out there? There is not at this time, Mr. Chairman. Okay, commissioners, anything you'd like to add? I have Rosa? a couple of things. And you may have already been uh, aware of this because the uh, information has been coming out in MAC about the uh, legislation looking to uh, advance uh, binding arbor arbitration to the yeah. correction officers. I don't know if this is something, I have a few extra copies. Oh, I don't know if this is something we as a board want to take a position on and uh, a resolution or something to our uh, elected officials in Lansing. Um, They're looking at expanding it to correction officers. Correct. Right, yeah. and I know when we when we negotiate, and you go to binding uh, this binding arbitration, uh, somebody's making the decision for us, and it always stuck in my craw because people that have that ability are able to uh, coerce. Uh, that's the way I put it, and get a, a, a bigger pay increase than maybe some of the non-represented employees. And and I, I know we try to do the best for our employees, but I'm not sure this. Uh, Expansion is good uh, for government. The other thing is, again, you may know about this. Uh, I was looking at, probably in Mac again, we've been talking about recycling. Uh, there's a couple of grants, uh, one up to a million dollars for improvement to your recycling. And the other one is a marketing grant. I don't know if it's April, I copied this out. Thank you. Thank you. I, it's we kind actually, of a short term, and I know we don't have a grant writer. We probably have to go to an engineering firm or something that could provide that service. But I don't know if this is a reoccurring or a one time. But if we're looking at those improvements in the future, or looking at a market study, there may be some money out there for us. Thank you. Uh, Jake and I actually met with the folks at Eagle. We Zoomed with them a few weeks back to see if, if did it makes sense for us to try and get something in. And that's how we kind of settled back on the needing that feasibility study of the, the local area. Because before grant dollars or any kind of business loan would go to fund improvements out there, we need that data to show that, yes, what we're thinking is feasible. Yes, there are enough recyclable materials in our surrounding area to feed a, a, a that is updated and maybe automated. Um, there is that, like you said, the market development piece in here that you could go for a grant for that. And we talked about maybe that being more appropriate for us. But then also the, the problem of sometimes if you get grant funds, you kind of go back to the back of the line for the next grant cycle. And what we really want is exactly what you talked about, that million dollar infrastructure grant. Uh, and Eagle, again, supports this hub and spoke model like we're, we're considering here. So really, I think market development is more for us right at the moment. But again, you know, they could fund maybe a feasibility report. But again, we don't want to go to the back of the line by getting funding for that. And so that's kind of why I suggested maybe using some of our remaining 2% monies that the MRF has that's committed to the recycling program to fund a feasibility study to, to get us going and get us in line for, for these. Sure. Right. Chairman Hope. I uh, brought this up in Human Resources and Public Works, but the speaking of the MAC, their legislative conference is coming up uh, Monday, March 21st through Wednesday, March 23rd. And there's quite a few uh, good breakout sessions, trial court funding, millage elections, Open Meetings Act, um, opiate funding, primer on the Headley Amendment, uh, ARP funding, lots of good breakouts on that. And the uh, early bird discount deadline is March 1st. Anything else? Nope. Kind of piggybacking a little bit off that. When is our next, uh, the, the second installment of the ARP funding coming in? It's like roughly 6.5 million. When is that? Due to hit the county. July ish. May. 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 It should be one year after we after we got the first May. And I know that there's been talk of uh, what is it? Right now the current regulations are ten million dollars up to for lost revenue. I think that's the latest projections of that. I know we use some of that out of the first 6.5 for lost revenue. Um, so I don't know where we're at in the process of if setting up, I know Commissioner Jalazinski has been wanting to do it for a long time, Chairman Hope and 
mentioning it every time he's we've gone to conference where they talk about ARP and you know I've been a big proponent of yes we need to do it let's wait I don't know if we need to wait anymore um, so I think we need to start now honing in what we want to use our ARP funds for um, and I'll come right out and say it. we've got a monster project going on in the county it's to 35 to 41.5 million dollars and spread out over time it's 60 million dollars to the county so if we can get that initial loan down so we don't have to borrow as much. It saves the county quite a bit of money. Um, again, I, I, we need to get a committee or some type of a group, not just one person, but deciding we've got to now start looking at doing what we're going to do with our, our, our funding, not just with the county covering everything, but also some of our partners in the community. Um, and we need to have, I would think that we need to focus, if we and again, if they want to look for something to partner with, we got a $41.5 million partnership. We can be more than willing to listen to some people if they want to help with the ARP funds or do something or, you know, again, that's our responsibility. We're county government. We're responsible for a jail. I get that. But we're also all one community. And again, if we didn't have to build the jail, if we had a nice, beautiful, up-to-date, we had all the criteria, plumbing works, everything works. We would be, we would, this, this would be an easy conversation. We could be planning something. We can't plan. We have, you know, we just talked about one big issue. We now we've got another issue. And again, it's not getting solved. Well, some of it's got to get solved this year, but it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. And anything that we can do to lessen the money that we borrow, the better. So anyway, that's all. I, that's, go ahead. That, our funding was broken into two payments, correct? So the one we get in May, that's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. okay. yes. Yes. And we have, we have basically until the quarterly report is due in April to figure out: Are we taking the ten million, the standard ten million, or are we doing the the lost revenue calculation for each year? I do believe that at sitting here, I do believe the ten million is is the way we probably would want to go with that decision. How to spend it is your decision, but the decision of whether to take ten million and do that calculation. We had 3.5 the first year, but I, I don't think that that calculation is going to prove out year after year to be that beneficial to us. Probably. I mean, the up percentage to it was 4.1%. Now it's 5.2%. So the counterfactual calculation, the, the <laughs> projection, which gives you the gap, you know, and, uh -huh. and that, that calculation has gotten higher. So the gap theoretically is, should get bigger. But, it, you know, so even if it was standard, if you were at 3.5, I forget, that's about what we calculated. Yep. So theoretically, you'll do that calculation for, um, you know, we did it for 20, 21, 22, 23, 20. If it was about the same each time we did the calculation, you'd be well over your 13, you know, and, and but we have to do that calculation each year to, to make that determination. Sounds like it takes 10 million. So yeah. that that work group I've asked Commissioner Jelzinski to sit on. We'll have to get that rolling. Yes. Soon. We'll we'll probably meet in February. Just let's get some emails out, find some dates. We'll add Commissioner Jelzinski to the list. Okay. Well, I I'll bring up. I did go to the Chippewa Township meeting last night. And they had ARP on there. What what can they use it for? And I. I think some of the townships are getting a little bit more comfortable because of the relaxation on uh, what they can spend it for. But I know there's still townships out there struggling. And, and like I said, I think at the last finance meeting, there is one issue that I think can go out throughout the county and that is the communication that we have with central dispatch, the 800 megahertz. Uh, there's a big cost to that. that some, some fire departments, some townships, uh, and I, you see the, the grant applications going in. I think there were like three of them last time to the tribe for 2% money that I think the tribe picked up on. But um, uh, I know in Shepherd Tri Township, they're looking at a $300,000 cost to incorporate 800 megahertz and replace their current radios and all. Plus, we don't have all the towers. We still have dark areas on the west side of the county and the south, south or west side of the county. I mean, there's issues and that maybe we can spend a small amount of that money. Well, it might be time to do a county feasibility study. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what can bring us up? What, yeah. what do we have to improve on? I don't know. I, I just, I, I, 
We got enough going on. So <laughs> Steve, his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I was just going to say, I know that's something that, you know, we just talked. I had a two hour meeting on Friday with another county and we went over all of the, the new, the change from the interim final rule to the final, final rule, if you want to call it that, but all the changes. And we, we spent probably an hour talking about the changes and then where are they looking at different things? You know, there's there's all kinds, but there's one township, talking about township, one township in the state that got over $10 million. So pretty much everybody can use, the, the townships can use that standard allowance and basically their money can be spent on governmental operations and that's the terminology. And so it's really anything that traditionally a governmental unit within the state does, they can do and be considered lost revenue because it got up to ten million dollar standard. So that that ten million, you know, whatever their number is, whether it's three hundred fifty thousand or it's, you know, I have this county happens to get, I think they got two and a half million or something. So in theory, they could say, well, yeah, we'll take the ten million dollar deduction. Still have to do the reporting and all that type of stuff, but it streamlines the reporting for them. But you know, and there are certain things you still can't do, you know, with with. Um, you know, congregates so or jails, we can talk about those kind of things because there are some specifics on congregate living and, and that type of thing. Pension life. Pension. I knew that was a yeah. 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 That I knew was gone. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 so, but there's things we can talk about, I think, in, in that. Yeah. Perfect. All right. I have nothing else. So at the call of the chair, I have 1130 to adjourn the finance administration. And if you want real quick on the union. Not, yeah. <laughs> Remember that delay. <laughs> Get all that